My name is Len Taylor, board member of the National Rivers Authority for the Welsh region, which is uh, based on catchment boundaries and therefore crosses Offa's Dyke and includes the whole of the River Wye and its tributaries. One of those tributaries is the River Lug. During discussions about the River Lug becoming a site of special scientific interest, it was suggested that a film should be made of the river. This idea was enthusiastically taken up by Mr. Leonard Chase, Chairman of the River Lug Internal Drainage Board, and also Chairman of the Wyatt Local Flood Defence Committee of the National Rivers Authority. The title of the film is The Rich Inheritance. and its main tributaries, the Arrow, the Pinsley and the Froome, collect their water from an area of about 300,000 acres, which is some one-third of the total River Wye catchment. The source of the lug is on a hill 1,795 feet high. This figure keeps cropping up during the film. This hilly upland area has a 50% greater rainfall than the lower valley. So prolonged heavy rainfall, and particularly snowmelt, will produce flooding in the lower reaches of the river. The area is home for three breeds of sheep, the Kerry Hill, the Radna Forest, and Clun Forest. This area of great scenic beauty was owned in medieval times by the monasteries and the marcher lords, and wool was their most important source of wealth. It has been grazed by large flocks of sheep ever since. There are still traces hereabouts of Offa's Dyke, an earth bank forming the boundary between Wales and Mercia, as mentioned by Len Taylor. Here we see the aqueduct, which has supplied Birmingham with water by gravity from the Elan Valley for nearly a hundred years. But that is a long, separate, fascinating story for another day. We go down to ground to have a closer look at Lipole Weir. No water running over as it should. Here we have a crayfish. And a bullhead. Two species present in the river that together with salmon and otters are high on English nature's list of reasons for declaring the lug to be a special river. Here's the JCB at work repairing the weir. Joe Bamford, one of the most outstanding men of his generation, who replaced wire ropes with hydraulic rams on machines of this type, so that one man can work easily and with precision and do more work in a day than 40 men using hand tools, horses and carts and wheelbarrows. 
There are many weirs from here down to Hampton Court, and used to be many more still, all the way down to Mordiford. The survivors, like this one, make the river what it is, especially by holding a lot of water in periods of low flow, like last summer. This man and his machine are working just like an artist with his brush. Job done, well done. Order restored to the river and water tumbling over the weir again as it should. A little way downstream at Amestry is the place where the Roman road from Caerleon to Roxeter crosses the river. A stone tablet records that the present bridge replaced an earlier one washed away in the great flood of 1795, 1795 again. From the air, we see a narrow valley with steep wooded hills on both sides. A heap of stones in readiness to repair Ames Tree Weir. long stone weir was capped with concrete before being taken over by Welsh water in 1976. The sluice provides a head of water to Amesbury Mill, where a turbine generates electricity. Hollows developing are a common problem and are best repaired before the entire weir becomes hollow and in danger of collapse. In the last 25 years, 10 new weirs have been built on the lug between Kingsland and Leominster. Their purpose is to control water level, 
and stabilize the river by regulating the flow of water in both flood and drought situations. The Roman road is very prominent and the church is dedicated to St. Elkman. In the churchyard are mass graves of some of the casualties of the Battle of Mortimer's Cross and also many memorials to the Turner family. James Turner in 1795 was one of the first breeders of Hereford cattle to keep records. The sawmills make a very important contribution to the local economy. Mortimer's Cross Mill, still in working order, where the weir and the sluices were restored by the Wye River Authority about 1970. We now enter the territory of the River Lug IDB. All land alongside the river pays drainage rates. All work on the main River Lug is carried out at the general public's expense, but the tributaries and watercourses alongside are the responsibility of the drainage board. We see the Great West Field, where the course of English history was changed on Candlemas Day 1461, when Edward, Earl of March's army, was victorious over the combined Lancastrian and Welsh forces and ensured his coronation as Edward IV. It's a much more peaceful scene today as we meet Peter Vaughan, who farms this riverside land. Mm. Farming here, you're the fourth generation to farm here. That is correct, yes. Yeah, and, and, and your great-grandfather, He started you tell here, me about him? Um, my great-grandfather started here in the eight, end of 1890. Yeah. Um, it was passed down to his son, yeah. uh, Captain Hamlin Williams, yeah. who um, was on the Lug Drainage Board That's in the right. 50s. He was chairman. That's, That's right. right. Yeah. Um, and then it, it passed to my mother, and yeah. then it's come to my brother and myself, yeah. uh, Simon, and myself, Peter Vaughan. Yeah. Um, we, in the years that, um, in 1900, when they first came here, yeah. there was probably 14 men working on this farm. Oh, gracious. But as the years have progressed, yeah. we're down to two men yeah. farming twice the amount of acres. Yeah. Uh, Derek, he, he's more my generation. And, and when he was here, he, he was farming quite differently. Tell me about his, his, his farming here. Well, my father came here, um, he started, took the reins on 40 years ago. Yeah. Um, he started with a dairy herd and then he moved into Pedigree Herefords and yeah. cereals and sheep. Um, he showed the Hereford successfully. Yeah. Oh, by the way, the Hereford herd yeah. of Kingsland yeah. have been here since 1900. Good gracious. Um, and 1900, they had a Royal Show champion then. Wow. Yeah. But things have progressed, and my father's nearly retired now, yeah. and we've moved from Herefords into Pedigree Charolais. Yeah. Um, we have the odd Hereford left here um, in the herd, very mature cows, very old cows. Yeah. Um, but as regards the um, Charolais, I could see uh, that the fat I industry, yeah. fat meat, was not required anymore. No. Charolais don't lay fat. No. So we went along with a new modern housewife yeah. to get, get lean meat. Yeah. There is a few pedigree limousines in here as well. Yes. Um, we do on this, they run commercially. Yes. All our farmers run commercially now. Yeah. Um, we run a flock of ewes, a flock of Scottish bread type mu mule ewes. Yes. Um, those uh, are bought annually and moved on, you know, at maturity. Yeah. Um, potatoes, we've encouraged potatoes on the farm and more corn. Yes. Um, as we move down to the river, we do irrigate all the potatoes. It's an essential system yeah. for farming to irrigate potatoes. Farming system is. is is, is, is very much, it stands as a, as, as a complete entity in, it, in itself. And, and you're, you're all the straw from your straw crops. Yeah, what, we, what happens to all the straw? We, all the straw is rotated to the stock. Yes. 
and then all the, the byproducts of the cows come straight back onto the ground. Yeah. So we're getting a total rotation of straw into cows back fertility on the farm. Yeah. This um, river ground is a sort of a grey luvial silt, yeah. but it needs a lot of fertility kept at it all the time. Yeah. That's why we keep stock on. Yeah. We keep a rotation of corn, potatoes, stock. That is our rotation. It's a traditional way of farming, yes. and we still keep with that tradition. So you call it sus a sustainable system Absolutely. in modern yeah. language. Absolutely. That's correct. Yeah. Um, if we went off that system, Fertility, I can see arable farms yes. in the country without proper rotations, mm. yes. the fertility goes down. Yes. You must have fertility in the ground, naturally yeah. born with stock. And this would be the keynote for the whole of the Lug Valley. Absolutely. I think all farmers in the Lug Valley would, would, would subscribe yeah. to I, your... I would say probably from the top of the Lug yeah. down to Lemster, yeah. the, the systems haven't changed drastically no. in the years that we've been here. No, that's, that's great. So. Um, as we move towards the river, you'll see the river system wouldn't have changed since my great-grandfather was here. No. Now, Peter, in addition to all your farming, you're interested in conservation wildlife. Oh, Tell yeah. me a bit about your duck pond. Well, we put the duck pond in about six years ago. It was a, there was an old meander of the river used to come round there and all it seemed to grow was thistles, docks and it was generally a real yeah. mess. So we uh, bulldozed it out, got a pool in there and we've encouraged wildlife of all description, herons, ducks, um, kingfishers come all over it and also we've wooded this area around here. We put uh, ash, larch all through that slightly weedy area there um, on the farm, we generally try to plant about 50 or 60 trees every year of the old species, oaks, ash, beech, uh, and I'll keep doing that yeah. until I pack up farming. Well, I particularly like the beech. I think, I think they look, at this time of year, they, they really have got a bit of colour and the beach, really uh, The beech actually in the Kingsland Basin grow extremely well. I don't know why. It, because Kings is quite a, a dry valley, yeah. but beech do take off well and grow yeah. extremely well here. I think they're a much underrated species of tree, tree to plant. They're a lovely yeah. tree. Yeah. I, I, and also, we, we, if you study, we put weeping willows along. The, they've just started the weeping willows have. Yes. Um, and I'll just endeavour to... A big difficulty is planting lilies. It rises and drops I upon, know. and the lilies seem, seem to wash out. We do want a constant <coughs> level for... That's right. For That's right. Lilies, yeah. Uh, but as regards the river, um, you know, when we walk down the river, you, you find um, dead crayfish that yeah. have been washed up, yeah. and people would probably never think a crayfish would be in the lug, yeah. but quite often we find crayfish, yeah. and the lug is also full of eels, yeah. terrific amount of eels here. Yeah. In 1976, this section of river went dry. Yes. And one particular Sunday we came down here, and there was just one, about a four foot width of water running down here, and there was more dead trout than I've ever seen in my life. And I think that particular week of that year probably ruined our fish stocks. Lug Green Weir, alongside Peter's duck pond. First of a series of weirs to bring order to a chaotic five mile stretch of river, having a fall in water level of about 50 feet between Kingsland and Lempster. This weir was built of stone-filled wire baskets, known as gabions, during the summer drought of 1976. It was destroyed by a subsequent flood and rebuilt by steel sheet piling and concrete as you see it today, complete with a fish pass in the middle. After that experience, the next two in the series were built of reinforced concrete the river between them being excavated and straightened, and this work was quite rightly subjected to much criticism. At this time, Richard Vivash was appointed as river engineer. He advocated a fresh approach based on working with nature by retaining the meanders and by the use of blockstone to build more natural looking weirs up which salmon and trout could pass. Mouse Natch Weir the first to be built of blockstone. In addition to all the water held upstream, a deep onion-shaped stilling pool has developed downstream. 
here comes the artist. In this case, gravel has built up in the inside of a bend, above water level, and has become vegetated. In a very short time, willow will grow and block the channel and aggravate the erosion problem on the outer bank of the bend. This stretch of the lug is a superb example of harmonious compromise, resulting in stabilized meanders, a satisfactory channel, and an abundance of water in dry summers. The following sequences are a good example of the river engineer following John Gummer's directive when Minister of Agriculture that the essential work of the river engineer be done in an environmentally friendly way. A seam of gravel at the toe of the bank just above water level can be clearly seen. The purpose of the work is to stabilize the bank.
The men tell me of several places where this very necessary revetment work is visited and used as a halt by otters. Two more of the stone weirs, Eiton weir, Coxall weir. Each has naturally developed its onion-shaped stilling pool to dissipate the energy created by a fall in water level of four to five feet in each case. Peter Vaughan told us how he and many other farmers in the Lug Valley have been encouraged to grow potatoes a crop that must have deep, fertile, well-drained, stone-free soil and be able to irrigate the crop in years of a dry early summer. Potato growers are also aware that they must not grow them too frequently on the same ground and there is already a noticeable increase in the number of arable fields going back to grass for a few years all in the cause of maintaining soil fertility and thus a sustainable and profitable farming system. Today's supermarkets demand long runs of very high quality produce, carefully harvested, carefully graded, and finally stored in ideal conditions. The split weir from the air. This key structure in a scheme completed in March 1969 was a brilliant scheme devised by Frank Hodges, engineer to the Wye River Authority, to protect Lemster from floods to which it had regularly become accustomed. The weir divides the lug so that two-thirds goes down the Kenwater th through the town and one third down the diversion channel dug out alongside the abandoned branch railway to Kington.
The diversion channel has to be flail mode every year to keep it in apple pie order. Lemster, with a population of 10,000 and the Priory Church of St. Peter and St. Paul. There were five mills in Lemster, one of them still grinding flour within the living memory of some of the oldest inhabitants. Here comes a train on the line from Newport to Shrewsbury, which is only the modern equivalent of the Roman road. George Ewart, while train spotting with his video camera at the ready, has filmed these amazing sequences of otters in the wild on the lug. This is the outfall from the Lemster Sewerage Works and a town the size of Lemster contributes about a million gallons a day of water into the river. The Sewerage Works. The refurbishment by Welsh Water of this Sewerage Works will have been the biggest single improvement to water quality in the river lug this century. Reports on the effluent way back in the 20s confirm that until the improvement works completed two years ago, the discharge was absolutely awful. We have come down past the attractive little church of St John of Jerusalem at Ford and come to Cadbury's factory. Meet the manager, Tom Bridge. Here at the Cadbury factory in Marlbrook, we manufacture a product called Milk Chocolate Crumb, which is used in the manufacture of our products at Bourneville in Birmingham and also Somerdale near Bristol. Now, Milk Chocolate Crumb is a key ingredient in the manufacture of Cadbury's dairy milk and is made up of cocoa liquor, which comes from cocoa beans, sugar and also a great deal of milk. It's here that we get the famous glass and a half of full cream milk in every half pound that people are familiar with. Now to give you an idea of the, the size of this operation, we manufacture 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all through the year, taking milk uh, from about 20,000 cows 
that generates well over half a million litres of milk every day of the week. To keep tight control on our strict hygiene requirements, we need to do an intensive plant clean every day. And in doing that, we generate effluent, which of course contains some milk solids. Now, as you'd expect, the National Rivers Authority um, are very strict in what we can put into the local river lug, and therefore we have quite a large and modern effluent treatment plant, which indeed is larger than that which serves the whole of the local town of Lemster. Things from the plant cleans are first injected with air, and um, this is required to change the pH of the material so that later on in the process the bacteria can get on with the job of digesting the milk solids and other materials. The material is then passed through various rotating arms and through several medium uh, beds which you'll see on the film and that actually makes sure then the clean water ends up in the river and what's left is a material that's taken away and put into local farms where it's injected under the soil well, it clearly has some agricultural value. It's by paying close attention to this whole operation that we manage to consistently meet the strict demands of the NRA and keep the Cadbury name in high esteem in the local community. And clearly that's something that's very important to us at the Marlborough Factory. These lagoons at the Cadbury factory, where large numbers of waterfowl congregate. We now come to Hampton Court, purchased by Richard Arkwright, only son of Sir Richard Arkwright, from the Earl of Essex in 1809. His fourth son, John, became an enthusiastic agriculturalist, buying more land, spending lavishly on the farmsteads and buildings, and investing in subsoil drainage, so fashionable in the 1840s. In every respect, John Arkwright assumed the duties of a landowning tradition. He rode to hounds, showed cattle with great distinction, and identified himself with every aspect of rural life in his miniature kingdom. 150 years ago this year, the Hereford Herd Book Society was incorporated with Queen Victoria, the first patron, and John Hungerford Arkwright of Hampton Court, its first president. His eldest son, John Stanhope Arkwright, wrote the well-known hymn, O Valiant Hearts. biggest on the river with a crest length of 55 yards plus the sluices. This is the sluice which is on the site of the old navigation block. And the small sluice was there to regulate a turbine in use until 1947 for sawmills and to generate electricity. And the screen is part of a combined fish pass and salmon trap installed at Cadbury's expense in the early 70s.
These are flooded gravel pits, and like the lagoons at Marlbrook, are home for hundreds of ducks, geese, and other waterfowl. The world-famous Vern herd of Herefords lived on the riverside meadows of Bodnam Parish. Breeding stock from this herd were exported to practically every country worldwide where grasslands are grazed by cattle. Marden Church, the place where the body of Ethelbert, King of East Anglia, was taken after being murdered by our old friend King Offa at nearby Sutton Walls. Marden Church also marks the termination of an embankment scheme, started at the confluence with the River Wye at Mordiford in 1973. A large-scale example of environmentally friendly work. Lug mills, the largest corn mill in England at one time, purchased by the River Lug Drainage Board in 1924 so that all the sluices, buildings and navigation lock that extended right across the river could be demolished. The end of the journey coincides with the sale of the last herd of registered pedigree Hereford cattle in the Lug Valley. Meet Colin Davis, the herdsman. He's a beautiful heifer, homebred, and lives on the lug. Mostly all the year round anyway, lives on the lug. She's in tremendous nick. It'd be a shame to see her go on the sale, but she's one that's got to go. And our cattle, they all run here on, on just 129 acres, somewhere around about 160 cattle. Uh, they graze these lug meadows for nine months of the year. And they do tremendous well. Look on both sides of the lug, even on the other side of the lug, they do tremendous well over there as well, even crossbred cattle. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're the finest grazing cattle in the world. And I they? don't think as uh, these meadows have been ploughed up for a good many years. I should think you could go back to 80, 90 years as I saw. Yeah. yeah. It was an awful row about it, and the chairman had to go and and, and make peace with Lady yeah, yeah, Croft yeah, over yeah, this tree. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you can see the, the cattle. They look they, for how dry it's been this summer. Oh, they they're, they're look looking so really well. looking really yeah. well, you know. Yeah. Oh, it's a wonderful picture. Finally, meet Julian Gallimore, chairman of directors of Russell Bourne and Bright who are official auctioneers to Hereford Herd Book Society, Russell Warren and Bright, like the Herd Book Society, celebrate their 150-year anniversary this year. with the oldest bridge, number one in Herefordshire. In the beginning of the film, Len Taylor referred to Offa's Dyke, built by the King of Mercia to keep out the Welsh. Here we see the very prominent flood banks to keep the river in. They have been built to protect Hampton Bishop from flooding, and if they're properly maintained, they should contain floods even as big as the Great Flood of 1795. The purpose of all this work and effort over the centuries is represented by the hamper of Lug Valley produce. Rib of beef, leg of lamb, wheat and hops, potatoes, apples, honey, dairy milk chocolate, and there's some wool in there for good measure. By the labour of the husbandman shall the nation flourish. Oh,